So this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, Mary Wu Sims. Uh, in the advertising for this event, we distributed a little bit of information. I'm not going to introduce her because I'm going to talk to her for an hour, so you will definitely get to know, <laughs> get to know her very well in that hour. But why don't we, we start, uh, Mary Wu, by uh, telling us about this photo. Um, well, this, this photo was taken um, in our first, at our first family reunion that took place in Australia. Uh, and that's my mother in this photo. And um, the reason why we had a family reunion in Australia is because I'm the child, I'm a biracial child. So my mother is Chinese from Shanghai, and my father is um, from Melbourne, uh, Australia. And uh, when my father was very young, uh, he traveled the seven seas. <laughs> and he landed in Hong Kong where he met my mom and um, fell in love. They fell in love and uh, they started a business together and they had six kids together. Mm. And I'm the eldest of my family. Mm. Uh, and the trip to uh, Melbourne was to meet up with my dad's side of the family um, uh, and there's Auntie Maureen and um, she has six kids as well. So. Tell us a little bit about growing up in Hong Kong, what that was like. Well, uh, I was born in the 50s. And uh, at the time, uh, Hong Kong was under British colonial rule. Um, and so I watch with great interest what's going on in Hong Kong at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, under colonial rule and the way that it was then, um, biracial relationships were frowned upon. Um, and women who had uh, married or were in relationships with um, white men were assumed to be of a sort, certain character. Uh, children, like myself, um, I think I learned racism, although I didn't understand it as such uh, when I was growing up because um, I had mostly biracial children as good friends. But um, I remember um, some of my Chinese friends, or their parents, more importantly, saying, oh, you don't associate it with people like that. So in a way, um, it's, it's a way for me to remember and remind everybody that racism is not something that is inherent in us as human beings. It's learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So those kids that refused to play with me because you know I was of um, in, in, in Chinese, it's called zap zhong in Cantonese. And that's basically a derogatory way of saying mixed race. And um, so uh, at the time, um, that's what it was like growing up. I had a lot of uh, biracial friends. Um, and uh, other than that, we had, um, we had uh, a pretty good life until, until personal relationship between my father and my mother um, broke down, which eventually, and uh, I ended up being in Canada as a result. But um, yeah, it was it was pretty. Uh, when I look back on it now, um, colonial Hong Kong was a very different place than it is now, and I I, I do think that some of that has been forgotten by by uh, by many of the young people who are struggling for their rights um, as Hong Kongers, which mm -hmm. I totally support. Yeah. yeah. But that, that might be for another talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember um, the, um, so maybe I'll just speak to everybody in the room as I spoke to you when we first met, that when, when, I, when, I, do, when I do oral histories, it's really about finding about a person's own personal experience, you know? <laughs> Um, you have a lot of expert knowledge, a lot. And, uh, but it's really less about exploring your expert knowledge and more about your personal experience. And there are so many stories that you told me when we did that. Uh, and I'm actually just remembering one now, um, and I'm going to ask you to talk about it, but you don't have to if you don't want to, because it was so um, formative for you. And you, you talked about when your father left and how you really saw the world change mm -hmm. because of your school changing and your situation changing. And that, I think, really informed your life, your subsequent life. Are yeah. you, do you want to share that? Oh, sure. Um, well, my, my mom, first of all, I, I have to speak a little bit about my mother because she was a great influence on me. Um, she 
was a woman who was denied an education because growing up in China at the time, um, she told me that her parents didn't want to waste money educating her. Not only that, but um, because she was the fourth girl that um, was born into a family without a male heir yet, um, she was actually given away to another family. So she was raised um, from about the age of eight by an adoptive family. And, um, and she ended up being in Hong Kong uh, because she refused to go along with um, an arranged marriage. So she was a fighter. And I would say that if there was anybody who embodied feminism for me, it was her. Just like she wouldn't have known the words. She wouldn't have been able to say, I'm a feminist or I'm a women's liberationist. But just the way in which she lived and the importance she um, imparted on us about, uh, you know, get an education, don't rely on a man, you know, make sure that you're independent, make sure you can care for yourself and so forth. I think those were, you know, life's lessons that I, that I, that I hold on to dearly. Um, but uh, uh, my father was, uh, they, they got into Hong Kong at a point where the war had just finished. Uh, Hong Kong was opening up. And um, if, you, if you had, if you were an entrepreneur, like my dad was, you could make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people in Hong Kong in the 50s who made a lot of money and are still making a lot of money out of Hong Kong. Um, and so my dad was very, like, mom and dad, um, they started uh, Hong Kong's first uh, Australian-style pub, and they're called the Walsing Matilda. It no longer exists. But in an interesting twist of fate, if you were to Google Walsing Matilda Hong Kong, you will find that much later on, it was actually a gay bar. <laughs> uh, and I didn't even know this, but of uh, course, this is many owners later. Um, so, uh, and then dad got into opening up other restaurants and he finally got into the fashion business because haute couture was huge in the 60s, mid 60s. And um, he just, he, he just didn't want to be with my mom anymore. And so he, he, he was the one who filed for divorce, leaving my mom with, as a single mom of six. And um, so, uh, and he, when he went on what I call his walkabout, he disappeared on us for a while. Um, he, I don't know where he spent all his money and perhaps um, some of the people who worked with him um, started skimming off the top. I don't know, I was young, too young to figure all, any of that out. Um, we went from being fairly well off to literally like, being living in poverty, like not having enough food to eat. Um, and that's why you will still find me eating every little thing in my fridge before I, like I don't throw anything out. Like it's gotta, and even if it has green mold on it, I will take the green mold off it and eat the whatever is left and cook it or do something with it. Um, so there's, there's some, uh, I guess early on I learned about class as well because you know, when you're, when you're pretty well off, um, you don't, I think you don't recognize the privilege that you have. And then when I lost it all, and then, um, well, not me personally, but when my, my parents split up and um, I wasn't uh, able to go to the same schools um, and some of the friends actually, you know, deserted me, uh, or that's how I felt because I, I, we weren't holding the parties, we weren't, doing the things that we used to be able to do, um, it, it really made me realize what, what class meant in a, more, as a, in a tangible way. Um, so we went from being very rich to living in poverty and, um, uh, and from having my own bedroom, right, to sleeping on the couch, from having people clean up after me and you know I didn't learn to tie my shoelaces until I was like seven or eight um, to a situation where my mom told me once that she came home uh, and found me sleeping on the couch where we were and there were like cockroaches crawling all over me so you know so it, it, it really gave me a very very early stark lesson in class and what that meant um, and uh, and 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 
So yeah, that was a hard time, and I don't I don't ever forget my roots. I don't uh, you don't forget your roots. Um, even though right now I would be considered as middle class, I don't forget where I came from. Um, when I look at people living with poverty or who are homeless, you know, I recognize that it's not. I don't. It's it's um, you know that I could be one illness away from joining them or one paycheck, I don't, I, I'm one, one pension check now, <laughs> from joining them. So, you know, I always make sure that I understand um, and remember um, those, that, that, that life that, that I had, even though I'm in a much better p position now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, um, you talked about being biracial, so mm -hmm. maybe now we could talk about how it is you and your mom ended up in Vancouver. Yeah. And what was the difference? What what was it going from being a biracial person in Hong Kong to being biracial here in Vancouver in was it late 60s, around 68 you landed? Or was it? 70, 70? 1970, yeah. yeah. Well, um, first of all, I, just, I also want to, like, in terms of the lessons that my mom taught me, I think yeah. early on she taught me about um, not racism, because, again, you know, she didn't, describe it that, as that. She just knew what was fair and what was not fair. Mm -hmm. And she would tell me, you know, that wasn't fair. Or she would show me that something wasn't fair. And I think that's an early lesson for me in terms of uh, thinking about fairness and equality and what that really looked like. We were getting on a bus. And we were sitting on the bus waiting. And, um, and this is colonial Hong Kong, right, where at the time, um, if you were Caucasian white, you were placed above um, uh, the, the Chinese population. And he, this is a tangible example. So this little, little old lady was getting on the bus, um, you know, Asian, white haired, you know, walking stick and everything. And the bus driver, who's also Asian, um, was saying to her in, in, in Cantonese, you know, like not very nicely, get on the bus, you know, what's your problem? You know, we're late, we're this, we're that, just trying to get her to get on the bus. And so we kind of observed it, didn't say anything, watched her get on the bus, got a seat, and that was it. Two stops down, um, she, the, the bus driver stopped and again, and there was a Caucasian woman with a baby in a stroller, and we're just sort of like watching this, scene unfold. And um, the driver puts the, the, the bus into brake position, gets out of his seat, gets out of the bus, and helps the woman with the stroller on the bus, right? So that was fine. But my mom was so incensed at the differential treatment that she went and scolded the bus driver <laughs> and said, you know, like, that, what are you trying to do? You know, she's your own people. And uh, not, not really saying like she's your own people, but basically pointing out the unfairness of how this bus driver had, had treated the older Asian woman versus this um, younger Caucasian woman with a baby in the stroller, right? And, um, and I, just, I, just, I just remember sinking down into my chair going, Mommy, what are you doing? <laughs> but I, I, I sort of, when I look back at that now, yeah. I think, oh, yeah, no, that's what she was doing. She was just trying to point out the injustice of it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, that, that picture and I, I think how I look in that picture is really indicative of how much I loved her. Love her, miss her, because she passed on a number of years ago. Yeah. So the story of me coming to Canada is, um, of course, there were six of us. Um, my dad was missing in action. And, uh, I, and, and mom couldn't afford to keep us in Hong Kong any longer. So we actually, for a year, went to Macau, which was then a Portuguese colony. And, um, and uh, everything was cheaper, lower cost of living. Um, and uh, I went to school there with my brothers and sisters, but even then it was really hard. It was really tough, because she was basically single mom looking after six kids, and she had to feed us, get us to school, uh, and um, provide for care, like shelter and so forth. 
And um, so she had a really good friend in, who had moved, immigrated to Canada, who said, come to Canada, come to Canada, come to Canada. They have social assistance here. They have free schools here. They have free medical here. Um, all of the things that we now take for granted, really, um, it, it's, 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 it was like, it was heaven. It was presented as a heaven. And um, so my mom was like thinking, well, she couldn't afford to fly six kids over to Hong Kong or to Canada. So um, because I was the eldest and uh, I was good in English, um, of course, I would be because my dad's Australian. But even in re reading, writing, composition, um, I was very good at that. So she had to make the tough decision to leave my siblings behind and just come with me by herself to Canada and um, start a new life here and then gradually bring my um, siblings to Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So in 1970, I thought, oh, what a great adventure. I'm going to go on this big holiday. But then it, it, it was a very sad, sorry, very sad time in my life, too, because watching my mom cry every day, missing my siblings, it was really tough. Who, who took care of them while they were, were they with the, the friend? Um, a couple of them went to the godparents, mm -hmm. like godmother, um, and um, uh, a few. Uh, a couple of them actually went into an orphanage. Wow. Yeah, with the view that they, my mom would make enough money yeah. in Canada and we'd get settled, and um, then they would be brought over. Yeah. So I, two of them did, mm. and then and then why the rest didn't come over is another story to, mm. in and of itself. Yeah. I think people don't realize that it was actually not uncommon to put your kids in like foster care or orphanages. People did that because there wasn't this kind of safety nets we have today. So my, when my grandfather got TB, yeah. my grandmother had four kids, six kids, yeah. and all of them went into foster care while she ran his business yeah. to keep everything together. And yeah. that was just normal. Yes. That, that, that uh, happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But difficult. Very but, difficult. But this was a strategy yes, to it keep was everybody a, going. It, you know, I mean, I look back at my mom's life, and I think everything that she did was a survival strategy for herself mm -hmm. and so that she could look after her kids. Yeah. So, you know, I don't make any judgments about how she tried to make that happen. You know, and so, you know, I mean, I, I held on to a lot of anger against my father for a long, long time as a result of what happened in my childhood. But, um, um, you know, but she, she uh, the woman that she was, she always used to say, you got to send your dad a, a Father's Day card. Because when he, f he finally emerged from his walkabout, um, you know, he, he, he realized uh, he'd lost his family, he lost his business, he had to start from scratch again. And um, so he was trying to bring his family back together. And, uh, and I was really very angry at him. And, so um, I wouldn't want to send him a Father's Day card. I, I, in fact, I only sent him joking. You know, those, all those like sarcastic Father's Day yeah. cards that you can find on the market now? That's the kind of card I would send to him on Father's Day. Because my mom would always say, don't forget, he's your father. And I'm like, oh, mom, you know, like, yeah. yeah. I think we know. Yeah, OK, anyway. <laughs> so yes, he always got a sarcastic card from me. It yeah. was never, you know, oh, you're the greatest dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, you got a job at Eaton's, is that right, after you eventually? Well, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of different work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because uh, when, I, when, I came to Can when, yeah. we, when we came to Canada, we, we we had $50 between the two of us, 50 yeah. US dollars when yeah. we landed in Canada. And um, so, and, and I don't think our story is any different from a lot of immigrant families that try to make new lives here in Canada. So we, um, we my mom went to work straight away and because um, she wasn't considered legal, um, like I am legal, I'm a Canadian citizen, so please don't hold anything. <laughs> But my mom did when we were younger against me. But um, when we came here, she, she couldn't get a job because no social insurance number. And, um, but at that time, it wasn't as big a deal. 
but having said that, because she was an adult um, and not a student, um, she couldn't work um, at a place where a SIN card was necessary. Um, so we ended up, she, she ended up being a domestic worker. Um, and I lived in with her. Uh, and so I'd do things like mow the lawn, wash the car, because I couldn't cook. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom's, mom said my cleaning left a lot to be desired. So she did the cleaning, cooking, and I did you know, some of the other stuff for, for her. Um, and uh, that was my way of earning my keep because um, the, the people that we were working for, they hired my mom. They didn't hire me. But the arrangement was that we came together. And so we had room and board together. Um, as domestic. Oh, live in. Domestic. Live in, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I was kind of like a domestic too, but not really. Um, so then I, I, um, I started work, um, had a student. Uh, I was a student at the time, so I got a job um, working as a waitress, like a lot of us do when we're young and no other jobs were available to us at the time. And then I went from that and I've done you know, chambermaid work, I've done gas jockey and so before I finished high school, those were the kinds of jobs that I had. Mm. Yeah. So I've done a lot of different things, including working as an elevator operator at Eaton's. OK. Yeah, which used to be, I believe, here, way which back when. Yeah. yeah, way back. Way, way back. Way, way back. Yeah, way, like way back before Sears took it, took it over. OK. Yeah, we're talking about like, you know, early 70s. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to ever so gently lead you to the, the story of your first kiss, which I know starts with meeting someone on a bus, at a bus stop. Oh, right. Well, well, that's not, well, so. it's, it, that would be, that would be my first lesbian kiss. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's not sorry. my first that kiss. That would be implied. All right. <laughs> this being lesbian life. Okay. Life. Well, I just wanted to make that yeah, clear. Yeah. And, and, well, and we can talk about the other kisses if you want. No, 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 no. <laughs> they're, they're, I, I don't think that was, they were as significant maybe as this one because it just, that was my life turning. Uh, yeah. Event pretty well, and um, and I and I hope I've told you this, honey. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> my my partner, my wife is here, so it's like okay, I make sure that I've already told this story, so it's not like a surprise. <laughs> so um, uh, let's see. I I, I lived um, near Maine and Twentieth uh, at the time. And um, on my way to work, I'd get on the bus first, and then further down a couple of stops, um, another woman would get on the bus, and um, and she was very short and could bear. And by that time, like just in a couple of stops, the bus would fill up, and so I would always just you know get up and say, "You want to sit down, right?" Because she was like her arm would be like uh, 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 like that, and meanwhile I'm taller, and so I would always let her sit. Um, at my seat, so, um, and that's just, you know, my mom taught me to be polite and courteous. If it was a person who was older than me, I still get up and let persons, even though now there are younger people who let me sit in their seats. <laughs> but um, so she, 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 then I realized, uh, we realized that we actually both worked at Eaton's because we'd get off at the same stop and then we'd both work, walk to work and then it was like, oh, you work here too. And um, so anyway, we became friends because we didn't live that far away from each other. And um, we were uh, uh, on the bus all the time. And then we started meeting up for coffee and so forth. And um, I really didn't think anything of it uh, at the time because I just thought, oh, we're good friends, right? So then um, one day she said, oh, we're, 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 let's go out together. And I said, oh, where to? And um, so she said, well, let's, let's go, to, go to a gay bar. And like, you have to think, well, at the time, G-A-Y was like, oh, happy to me, right? So I'm like, oh, OK, happy bar. And, and, you know, and I thought, OK, that's, that's fine, right? And then my, you know, and, and, and in Hong Kong at the time, there was not even a like, description for what homosexuality was until much later I, 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 I learned that, oh, if you say this, you know, 同性恋 or 同志, then that meant, 
you know, oh, it's you're you're gay or lesbian, right? But at that time, there was no no nothing. I I didn't know about gays and lesbians at the time. So anyway, I said, okay, happy bar. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so I said, oh, a happy bar. And she goes, uh, no, no, not quite. Well, we, yes, it, it is. And then, but she said, it's a homosexual bar. And I was like, oh. And um, so I thought, okay, this is an interesting thing. I'm, uh, I'm, and I, of course, I, I thought of myself as being very liberal at the time. So I thought, oh, okay, well, this is just a new experience. So we went, and um, it happened to be BJ's. And for those of us who remember BJ's, it was one of the, I think, the earliest places that it was a mixed crowd of gays and lesbians. It was very open, and there were drag shows. And um, so that was my first introduction to drag queens and my first introduction to people who eventually were transitioned um, uh, into, into uh, that, that were released through trans transition to women. And um, so, uh, so we went to the bar and went in, and that was it. And when the show came on, uh, we're sitting at a round table, and I was sitting on the outside of the table, and and my friend was sitting on the inside. And she had, because of how short she was, it was really hard for her to see the stage. So I sort of really, like seriously, I was very innocent about this. I said, well, why don't you come and sit on my lap? You can see better, <laughs> right? So, so, she, <laughs> so she came and sat on my lap, and, and, and I was very, like really, I had no like, clueless about what was about to happen. And she took it as an invitation, right? So as soon as the lights went down and the show happened, you know, she started to kiss me and I was like sitting there going, oh my God, oh my God, this is like completely different. I've never felt this way again. And then as soon as the show was over and the lights came on, I literally bounced her half, away, half the way across the room because I didn't know how to, like, I was just like, oh my God, she's sitting, I'm, I, I really, I was embarrassed, I was, kind of thinking, oh, I hope nobody noticed that I'm like 7,000 shades of red right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that was that experience. And it was, it really, I, I wasn't sure why I was feeling the way that I was feeling, other than I realized, wow, this was definitely different than I've ever felt before um, when you know, I had boyfriends at the time, and this was why it was such a shock to my mom when I came out to her as a lesbian. She said, but you had so many boyfriends. How can you be gay, lesbian? And I said, oh, well, I said, um, I, I think if I look back, I realized that I was lesbian a long time ago. I mean, that explained all the crushes that I had on girls when I was in like grade school even. But I had no name, no terminology, no words for it. So it wasn't until much later that I realized, oh, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was uh, the feeling was nowhere near what I had ever experienced with boyfriends, right? <coughs> so that uh, that was that, right? But at the time, I have to admit to being really scared. Um, because uh, I didn't know what to say to my, like, I, I wasn't sure what was going on uh, with my sexuality. I, um, I, was, uh, I was afraid, and I was even more afraid when she confronted me with my sexuality um, and said, oh, I thought you were gay. And I said, well, a lesbian, like, because gay then meant lesbian as well. But anyway, um, and I said, no, 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 I, I don't, I'm not. Right? And she goes, well, I want to live with you, and you know, I want to be with you. And I was like, but I'm not. I'm not. Like, I just sort of, like, my reaction was not, I think, the best at the time, looking back. I, because I was confronted with my sexuality mm -hmm. and not being able to actually name it, not being able to understand it, not being able to figure out how to explain this to my parent, mm -hmm. well, my mom in particular. I didn't care about my dad. But um, it was really hard um, trying to figure out, like, what's going on here? So um, I basically ran the other way. And, um, and, and yeah, aside from that moment, 
it, there, nothing ever happened between somebody who basically um, helped me realize my sexuality and myself. That was that. Was that. But when we talked a month ago, you told me you did go back to BJ's. Oh, I had, <laughs> yes, by, yes, I did go back to BJ's. Um, you know, I became very close friends with one of the drag queens. Um, I, uh, the people there were so, so open and loving and free and, and just, it was actually very, um, it was very liberating to see people so comfortable with who they are. But, mm. but it was just there, yeah. right? Because once we stepped out of that environment, we were in the straight world where, you know, you could be discriminated against and fired because you're gay or lesbian. You could be beat up. You could be a whole number of things and have no recourse, right? So when we were in that environment, it was... It was it was it was a beautiful thing because we all we all were there for the same reasons, just to be who we were, mm. who we are. So I remember from Forbidden Love, actually, Amanda White talks about uh, who's indigenous talks about feeling very uncomfortable in the gay and lesbian bars that she went to, and so she ends up in the jazz scene here. Mm. How did you feel in that scene? Did you you say you felt welcome? Yeah, I, I felt I, I did feel welcomed, and I don't I don't know if it was just the people with that I was with, um, and uh, um, she might have been talking about the van port, I think. Or yeah, or yeah. Or well, there. I mean, I've been there too, yeah. um, because in in those days there was the there was the van port where um, it was pretty it was a pretty rough mm -hmm. um, a rough place to go to. Um, and um, but B, B, BJ's was very different, um, and um, so I, I I really didn't feel unwelcomed. Um, it was it was as though everybody was just there to have a good time, meet each other, to have a dance, um, and and that was what we were there for. Um, uh, having said that, uh, you know racism d does exist in Canada, and um, to say that I didn't experience any racism would be you know, untrue either so mm -hmm. as well I mean mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you so your dad ends up back as you were saying earlier back in your lives and I wanted to ask you to tell that story uh, you shared with me because I think it really captures the vulnerability queer people were in in that in that time period yeah so when you when he found out that you were gay um, what was his response? Well, um, I, 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 I don't do things half measure because my mom used to teach me, you know, if you're going to do something, just do it. Like, don't just, you know, step in and step out. You've got to actually take it to completion. And if you're not going to do something, then don't commit to it. Um, so uh, once I went, I'm a lesbian, hooray! I wrote to everybody in my family, my grandmother in Australia, my, all my siblings, my, you know, anybody who I could write to and, family, and said, I am a lesbian, I'm really happy, I've met somebody, we're gonna be living together, and, that, and, and just came out, right? So, um, my dad didn't write back to me um, what I, uh, experienced was a lawyer phoning me and saying I'd like to uh, I've been retained by your father to meet up with you and 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 um, talk about a few things and I was like whoa what would he what you know I was quite puzzled and I thought oh I wonder what this is all about and again I'm kind of like I always think the best of people because that's another thing my mom used to tell me is that you know people People need to be given the benefit of the doubt, and then um, you know, always take the high road. All of these things, right? So, um, I just thought, okay, what 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 does Dad want? So I went to the meeting with the lawyer, and and to this day, I can't walk past the UK building at Granville and Hastings without without kind of thinking about this situation. So I met with the lawyer, and the lawyer said to me, um, I have been retained by your dad, and I hope you understand what that means. It's basically that I've accepted a retainer from him, and whether or not I agree with what actions he's asked me to undertake on his behalf, um, I am 
proceeding to act uh, as he instructed me to. And I was like, OK. And I, would, I was 18, 19 at the time, all right? So not, not, not old, but you know, and not young, but I was still sort of feeling my way around, um, being, being away from home. And so um, he said, your, your dad has instructed me to tell you that if you don't get on a plane, and I have the ticket, money ticket for you to go back to Hong Kong, um, if you don't get on a plane within the next week, um, that I am instructed to have you committed to a mental institution. And because you're underage and your partner is older than you, um, I am to swear out a warrant um, to have her arrested for corrupting the morals of a minor. And there was such a, um, there was such a charge at the time. And um, so I was pretty well in shock. Um, I just thought, well, you don't know what my thoughts were at the time. But I basically thought, this man has not been in my life. He's stepped out on my mom. He's caused so much trouble in our family. And now he's come out with this threat that he's going to throw me in a mental institution. And, and I was very worried about it, because at the time, um, uh, homosexuality was still considered a mental illness and hadn't wasn't changed until a little bit later. Um, and the charge of corrupting the morals of the minor was, in fact, on the books because I wasn't of legal age, at, which was at that time 21. So I bas I went back, told my partner at the time. I said, "This is what happened," and um, and um, she said. Uh, after we both got over the shock, um, she said, well, she says, um, I know how to go underground. I've got friends in Berkeley. <laughs> 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 and those are people who know Berkeley University in California was like a very radical university. And, um, and it was really uh, quite, quite something. So, so I, I thought, OK, fine. You know how to go underground. Excellent. So I just went back to the lawyer. And I said, you know, I, I basically said, uh, how dare he? And um, if he proceeds to act on his threats, um, I will go underground. He can forget that he has a daughter. And he will never see me again. So. The lawyer said, OK, I'll convey your message. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then um, nothing ever happened. He, my father never went through with, with his threat. But having said that, he was never really accepting of my lifestyle um, and, uh, and, and basically was very um, adverse to, 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 to uh, my partners um, would uh, refuse to meet them, even when we had family occasions where, um, you know, other people that were, that were, you know, straight were just automatically, you know, my sister's boyfriends, my brother's girlfriends, yeah, oh yeah, sure, invite them, but oh no, not not the lesbian, and her partner, so yeah, so that that was that was that for a long, long time, for decades, yeah. So we, we had a fairly tense relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to move now to your, um, how you ended up becoming involved in the union. And then uh, ultimately, uh, that was a pathway to becoming the BC Human Rights Commissioner. But I'm looking at your watch. What time is it? Oh, three. three. <laughs> so you can see why. Like, we've only just started, right? And <laughs> the idea was to end at 3 and then take a little break. But I'm not going to end. Just yet. We'll just maybe go another 10 minutes. Sure. We started I, late. We did start anyway. late. Yeah, so that's OK. Everybody, right. everybody OK? Everybody yeah. feeling OK? Yeah. Oh, oh, there's one thing. OK, good. So we'll, we'll just keep going a little longer. Is that yeah. all right? Let me suggest yeah. one thing. No dates were mentioned. I think dates are critical. Oh, cool. dates. Yeah, yes. no dates mentioned. So when we were talking about the sort of end of the 60s, early 70s there with that. Right. But, but how old you were at a particular I, I, Yeah. Yeah. I, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. so no, 70, right. it would, right. I would have been about seven, it would have been 1974, five, and I would have been about 18, then 18, 19, uh, when, I, when I came out to my family and um, when that incident happened with my father threatening. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have to say, when my 21st birthday came along, I, I really had a good celebration <laughs> as a result. Um, but um, OK, so at the same time as all of this was going along, I was working for BC Telephone Company, um, which some of you will now know as TELUS. And um, I started off as a telephone operator because when I applied for a job there, um, we were, uh, women were streamed into, because they had three what they called operational streams. So one was clerical, it speaks for itself. One was operators. Uh, and one was what they called the plant. And the plant was where all the men would be traditionally streamed into. And then um, clerical jobs, um, there were some that were really good paying clerical jobs, but um, there was a, the, the telephone operators um, was where I started my uh, working life outside of school. And uh, so I applied for a job in the clerical division, um, and it was called a, a mail as an M-A-I-L driver. It was an independent uh, work, which I loved. It was driving, which I love. Uh, and um, it was still in the clerical field, but it was considered to be one of the few men's jobs in the clerical stream uh, because uh, it was independent and it was driving, right? Because, you know, we, we know women can't drive. But <laughs> anyway, um, so, and that would have been in 1976-ish, all right? So I applied for the job, and I remember um, going for the job interview and the supervisor saying to us, because there were three women and about seven men uh, that applied for this job, and um, there were three positions, right? So uh, we were told to go to the mail room, and at the time, the Part of the job was not just collecting envelopes and mail and d delivering it to all the different stations that um, uh, BCTEL had around the, uh, Vancouver and Burnaby and U West. Uh, it was also to collect the coin boxes. Um, all of those telephone coin boxes would be emptied and then they'd be put into um, little boxes and then those little boxes would go into a a small little metal um, suitcase, which you then picked up, and then you had to deliver to 789 Seymour, uh, the head, uh, 786 Seymour, where is the head office of BC Tell, and they throw all the coins in and get them counted and deposited and so forth. So um, we, the three women that applied for the job were, set, were told to go and pick up the boxes from the conveyor belt and take them from point A to point B. Not the men, just the women, right? And I was like, OK, well, I'll go do that. But why aren't the guys doing that? And he goes, oh, the men, the, the men can do it. I just want to know if the women can do it. So assumption made that the men would be able to do it, and the women were the ones that had to be tested. So of course that just got my adrenaline going, and I just picked, just went over, picked up two boxes, and flung them on the conveyor belt, and said, "You know, there is that okay?" <laughs> I would have flung it at his head, but anyway. <laughs> um, so so, but even though we passed, um, we we didn't get the jobs. So I just thought, well, wait a minute. So I read the the job sheet, and I read seniority. And so I went and I talked to the shop steward and I said, well, I didn't get that job and this has happened, you know, that he only tested the women and I don't think that's fair. Um, I want to file a grievance. And uh, so it, he said, fine. Uh, took the grievance. Um, it didn't go very far because obviously I had the seniority. Actually, two, another woman and myself had the seniority uh, and so two of us got the jobs, and one of the guys got the job, the three openings, right? So, um, of course, then that got me interested in the union movement, because um, I thought, wow, this is, this is an organization that helps uh, with, with work, women's rights, workers' rights, and that's how I got involved in the labor movement. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then that took me on a path uh, to 
um, to working on uh, early affirmative action programs, uh, equal opportunity programs, uh, early uh, examples of work, anti-workplace harassment or anti-sexual harassment programs, um, and that was all in the 70s. Just at the same time as the, the women's movement and the feminist movement was talking about all these issues mm -hmm. and, and how they had to be you know, integrated into the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and we had the Status of Women report, and then subsequently Rosie Abella's report on employment uh, equity, and yeah, so that so that's all it. around. <laughs> so <laughs> things were happening yes. in the 70s and yeah. and and and, uh, and 80s, and and that's really how I got involved in human rights work was just through working in the labor movement um, and and learning skills um, through through the labor movement. And uh, well, I, I think what we need to do is because I've been thinking a lot about next year is the 50th anniversary of the Royal Commission on the Status of Women report. Right. So I've been thinking about different things to do, public events and stuff to do, and I think we need to have you come back. Oh. Because this hasn't been long enough. Yeah. And we'll just talk about those years. Sure. Um, as part of the 50th anniversary stuff, if you're open yep. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we can Absolutely. all look forward to more of that. So maybe we'll just end with, because um, the BC Human Rights Commissioner position was so important, um, so can you tell us when you, you, that job started and maybe um, a couple, one or two stories um, that were really meaningful for you of work, things you were able to accomplish in that, in that position? Well, I, I think that um, uh, it's important to note that the human rights, I started my human rights work within the labor movement and then subsequent to that when um, Canada started developing all its human rights commissions. Um, uh, I worked in BC uh, with the BC Human Rights Branch and then subsequently with the Canadian Human Rights Commission and, and, and had, a, I think, a fairly long career in human rights. Uh, one of the few that actually started at the bottom, if you will, and then moved to chief commissioner back here in BC. Um, I understood very well um, the inner machinations of Human Rights Commission, but I also a, was a complainant uh, a couple of, uh, three times, um, human rights complaints that I filed. So I, I know what it's like to have filed a human rights complaint. And so I came to the job here in BC as Chief Human Rights Commissioner with a unique set of um, experiences. And um, so the kinds of things that I'm really proud of is, um, or that we were among the first to uh, recommend was uh, we issued a report called Human Rights for the Next Millennium in 1999, which recommended gender identity be included in the Human Rights Code. Um, we also recommended that social condition uh, be included, and the importance of social condition is to recognize poverty and um, social condition as a human right, mm. which it is under the UN covenants that Canada is a signatory to, but we are very bad at um, actually living up to those commitments that we've signed up to uh, around um, economic rights, so therefore social condition. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, there was lots of things that I, that we've done, and um, you know, it's 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 unfortunate that we had to wait another 20 years before the gender identity actually was included as a human rights um, protected ground of human rights. Uh, but um, you know, I I think that that the whole discussion then with the trans community and um, was really important. Another initiative that I'm really very um, proud of is the work that we did with ind indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Um, because even then, back in 1996, uh, seven, eight, um, we were uh, very concerned uh, about the push-out rates of uh, indigenous kids from school. Push-out rates? Well, this is what the indigenous, <laughs> what my friends of mine in the indigenous community call it, which is basically, if your reality isn't reflected in school books and, and the teachers that are teaching you, and and you're 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 subjected to racism and um, differential treatment when you go to school. Um, basically, you don't want to stay in school. So indigenous ki kids were leaving 
and not completing high school. So and so therefore, out, instead of dropping out, they're getting pushed, we're getting pushed out. Yes. And I didn't, I, I, and I wanted to adopt that language because I think it's really important to recognize why they were leaving school and not that they were just dropping out because, oh, you know, all the stupid stereotypes about why kids drop out. There's reasons. And so um, I wanted to find out what those reasons were and where in BC there were best practices. So we were just about to embark upon um, best practice hearings uh, around British Columbia. Um, to try and um, determine uh, how we could improve the education system so those push-out rates would be minimized. The other area that we um, did a lot of work in was work with Indigenous communities around um, the high apprehension rates of Indigenous children from their families and what was going on there. Mm. Um, and sadly, we, we actually we didn't get to go get very far because there was an election um, the government that was supportive of the work that we were doing was uh, decimated. A uh, new government came in, um, didn't believe in that human rights of the type that we were trying to move forward was important. And so the Human Rights Commission um, was disbanded. And, um, and we've only recently, in September, had a new Human Rights Commissioner appointed. Um, having said that, uh, her role is very limited. It's not the same kind of, um, doesn't, uh, she doesn't have the same kind of power that the commission that I had it had. And I think that's by design because, you know, uh, as, I, as I said before, the, the, the provincial government is the largest employer, the largest service provider. And um, there's a little bit of self-interest in not making it as effective as it can be. Um, the only thing that I can sort of take solace in is the fact that finally the Human Rights Commissioner is an independent office of the legislature, which is very important. Um, so to ever try to get rid of her or to get rid of the commission again would take um, a, a, a more, more of a whole parliamentary uh, le legislative uh, agreement other than the government saying, oh, we don't like this now, and so bye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It means, it doesn't mean that it can't happen. It would just be harder for it to happen. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, we're not finished yet because, so just to, you know what's going to happen, but just to let everybody else know, I'm just going to show you on a slide. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, Mary Moon and I are going to take a break right now. And uh, I'll show you the rest of these pictures uh, later, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
um, that the racism actually uh, was hurtful. And so the way that in which I um, dealt with it was to file human rights complaints. Uh, or um, one time, uh, and I'll, I'll just tell the story about this one experience that I had when I was chief commissioner. Um, at the time, uh, the Doug Collins complaint was very much in the news because um, Doug Collins was a uh, news columnist with the North Shore News. And he had written a number of columns in which he um, basically uh, denied the Holocaust took place, um, called Hollywood um, pretty well uh, the you know, Jewish conspiracy, uh, and um, subsequently said that all homosexuals and immigrants, you know, they should not be here. And, uh, and so the commission didn't file the complaint. These were individuals who had filed complaints against them. And they were subsequently in the, um, uh, at before the tribunal, and the commission took a, an interest in the case. So anyway, Mr. Collins and I happened to be on uh, a radio talk show together. <laughs> Um, and he kept calling me Miss Wu. And I realized that he was doing that for a reason, right? Because my name is not Miss Wu. Uh, my name is Mary Wu or Ms. Sims, basically. And um, so I just said him, I just called him on it. And um, I, said, uh, I said, I don't understand why you keep trying to call me Miss Wu. Are you just trying to make sure that people understand that somehow I'm different. I'm not Canadian. I'm not, uh, shouldn't be here. What, what's, what's that all about? I'm happy if you call me Mary, Mary Wu, Ms. Sims, um, but I, my name is not Miss Wu. And uh, apparently the radio announcer later said to me, that's the first time I've heard Doug Collins shut up. <laughs> he had nothing to say. But you know, those are the kinds of things that can happen. Um, you know, so there, there's the racism, and uh, also when you when you are called upon to be the, you know, the public face of, of human rights in British Columbia, uh, and and then also um, doing the, some of the things that I did around raising uh, GLBTQ rights. Um, you know, I've been called names. I, I've had hate mail. In fact, come, I went through my papers recently and came across hate mail. Uh, and um, but I, I just have to. I, I I don't know. It's maybe my mom's strength coming through, where I just go, wow, sad for you, but I'm going to keep on going, right? So I think that's how I I just went th plowed through it. Um, yeah. That's a very interesting question because I'm, I'm having to reflect on it. And um, I just, I, I have good friends. I have good friends who um, support me. I'm, and um, structurally, I, I, when, when, you're, when you're fighting against the system, uh, structurally, there is no support, really. Um, there, there, nobody's, nobody within the existing power structure is going to say, yes, please come and take us on. Um, uh, they're going to r rail against what you're doing. Uh, and um, so really, you've got to find the support in, within your own community, where you can find it, within your friends, within um, your family, uh, like basically it's community because when you are coming up against the existing power structure who wants to maintain the power, maintain the privilege, it is not that easy to go up against it and they're not gonna wanna be your friends. Um, and uh, uh, and um, so I, I think that uh, for anybody who is thinking of working in this area, it's, it is, it is, it, it, you've got to believe that you're doing the right thing. 
you've got to actually believe in yourself and believe that what you're doing is the right thing and that the uh, and that changes are necessary um, that equality is important and not just equality for your own person and your, like the, the the group that you belong but um, you know, if one person is oppressed, all are oppressed. So you've got to take that attitude into the work that you do and then um, just get on with it because you're going to meet up with opposition um, and people aren't going to like what you uh, have, have, have to say about these issues. Thank you. Next question? Um, what's... Uh after this, you know, your story was just amazing. Um, you know, I've seen you through the years in different positions, different things, and just to hear the story behind it all is, is fascinating. Um, what's uh, particularly piquing your passion right now in terms of what your involvements are? Well, I, at present, um, I think this is this project is really important to me. I've, I've, there are some of the young people that are in this room that I've met through um, Elisa's class at SFU, uh, and also that I've talked to um, at the Dyke March, um, the post Dyke March events. And um, I think that, that um, their energy, their enthusiasm really sustains me, really gives me energy. And yet at the same time, I'm also really angry that that the kind of th rights that we fought for um, in the 70s, you know, sexual harassment, you know, to, to be working in environments free from uh, sexual harassment or racial harassment or um, any any kind of differential treatment that that we are 40, 30, 30 on years later and we're still fighting. We're still. Uh, demanding our rights, you know, and so I think that also, you know, it's, a, it's okay to every now and then to be a bit angry about, about things. And, and the other thing that, um, that I, uh, right now, particularly in Canada, we've got a federal election coming up. And it's really, really important that people have a really serious examination about um, what, what, what kind of Canada we want to be living in. I'm not going to urge anybody to vote for or against any political party. I, I want you to really examine, like you as a person, which party is going to best represent what you, who's going to protect your rights, who's going to best represent what you want to have. Not vote against some other guy because you're upset at them. Yes, absolutely, that uh, that that is a motivator. but. Beyond that, who represents, what party, what individual best represents where you would like to see uh, Canada move forward towards. And um, so that's something that, that I'm very passionate about right now. Um, and the, uh, the environment, um, absolutely. Um, you know, David Suzuki once um, said, uh, without planet Earth, there are no things, there's no human rights. Because there won't be any humans left on this earth, right? So, um, so I think that's another thing that um, I'm very passionate about. I haven't really figured out where my space is in terms of working on that issue. Oh, sorry, <laughs> might be, um, but uh, I, I'm definitely trying to figure out where I'm going to go on that one. Oh, um, I, I, I'm not quite sure that it affected my view around um, feminism uh, or lesbianism, uh, other than that I'm very mindful um, as a, a settler in this land, having been in a colonized environment, about um, the, ind the indigenous people here in Canada and my place in in Canada as a result. Um, so I think uh, 
you know, I, I'm, I, let me say this. I'm here speaking as a, a, a lesbian, um, because we are in lesbian oral testimony. But all of us are very complex individuals. We come from complex backgrounds. I don't want to be just known as the lesbian, which for a long time I was known as, because that happened to be um, the, 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 the activism that I had, I guess, more recently or had my claim to fame to before I came to uh, BC to act as, um, to, to, to be the chief commissioner. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a racialized woman. I'm, you know, uh, I am getting older. I'm starting to realize things that my body can and cannot do anymore. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's a really important to recognize the intersectionality that exists in all of us. Um, so I, I can't really comment on your question other than to say that, uh, that, that, that we're all very complex beings and we bring to our experience all those complexities and, it, and, and our experiences inform how we deal with um, colonization, how we deal with sexism, racism, uh, all of the various experiences that we're going to live through um, as we go along on this earth. Here's right over here. Um, when, well, I, I think that because I'm, uh, when I first came out, um, which was in, in the 70s, right, um, immigration in Canada had just started uh, to open up again. We had the Chinese Exclusion Act for a long time. Um, the immigration policy in Canada was primarily a white immigration policy. And so it wasn't until um, the late 60s and the early 70s that immigration was really opened up to include a lot of people from all diverse backgrounds. So, um, so I, I, I recognize that, but also because I was lesbian at the same time, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me uh, at that time. So I, for, for, for me, I recognize I don't think I knew it at the time, but later on I recognized the role that, that I, I play just for being an elder queer lesbian person, um, that um, I was one of the very few at that time. And so um, things like being interviewed on, uh, early on by Chinese radio or television and um, a younger Chinese person coming up to me and saying, I came out to my parents today, and they said, oh, you're not going to get up to much. And I all showed them the picture of you in the Chinese newspaper as chief commissioner, right? It, it did a lot. Like, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me um, that that had that kind of significance for that person. So um, it, it's, I, I, it's hard to answer your question because I think it's it's how people see me through the work that I do or as I am, uh, as opposed to me saying that. Um, if if you get my drift, yeah. So I just I just live my I just live my life, do what I believe is right, and then hopefully it it um, it resonates with people. Mm. Yeah. I'm just going to throw something in here. You said something to me when we when we talked earlier that really struck me. Um, I said that how uh, fantastic it was that you brought these two lenses to your work in human rights, um, being uh, a racialized person and being a queer person. And you said, I don't bring those lenses to my work. I go to my work. I see what's needed. I attend to their needs. And I was like, oh my god, that's wild. That's great. <laughs> that was really, but that really said a lot about you, wow. you know, and how you're present in that moment with whoever is there with you. And y you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think you have a real 
authentic self that you you bring to the world and to, to your work that was so apparent in how you said that so yeah thank you thank you thank yeah, you yeah, you're yeah. welcome uh, mm -hmm. did you have a question Sure. Okay. Because you're, you've, you've been active and doing a lot of organizing, a lot of uh, just so much great work for just pushing progressive, progressive ideas forward. Like, what kind of advice would you have for, for young people who are also wanting to change the world? Like, like <laughs> how, how, well, how would you advise them to organize? What, what was effective from your experience? And just kind of general advice for us young radicals. <laughs> yay, yay for those rad young radicals. I was one of those once. Uh, maybe still am, just an older radical. Um, I think, I think um, I, I, you know, when I, when I watch young people like Malala and uh, Greta, uh, and they are so disrespected because they happen to be young people having a message, uh, and an important message for people to listen to, but because of their age, um, they, uh, they're not given the credit, right? And, and um, uh, it's because some of us don't have the answers, so we put them down because we don't have the answers, and gee, they coming, they're coming up with great answers. And um, so I, I think you cannot be deterred. I would encourage you not to be deterred um, because, uh, you know, it, it, um, power never gives up easily. Right, and so therefore you need to just absolutely insist on being heard, um, and don't be afraid to organize. Even if you do it wrong, you're going to learn lessons from it, right? And um, then apply what worked the, for the next uh, issue that you want to organize around, and what didn't work, you don't don't do it again. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, so it's, it's, it's really as simple as that. But I think sometimes we get wrapped up in, in um, and I, I'm not saying even young people, I think, I think all of us are, tend to go, oh, gee, you know, what if I did that, and what if I did that, and what if I did that, and what if I did that? And then nothing actually, it's paralysis. You don't actually go ahead and do it. So it's just important to just take that step. If you believe that there's something that needs attention and needs organizing around, you'll find people who will be by your side. You just gotta actually step up and do it. And, not, and again, not be deterred by people who want to say, well, why are you talking about that? Because I remember those days, you know, why are you talking about sexual harassment? I thought girls like to be like, you know, and, and it's like, oh, well, you know, all the stereotypes about um, you know, why, like I should, should have shut up according to the <laughs> stereotypes people have of Asian women, right? Or, East Asian women, but no, there's just not not possible. Um, so yeah, you just have to go for it. Yeah, just go for it. I was that reminds me. I was reading uh, that oh, you know the equity report the, that Rosa Liabella did in '84, and that first the sexual harassment in the workplace. That first case, which I can't remember which one it is, it was waitresses that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The they 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 won on the argument that. Uh, before it was overturned, and that um, all, men only harass attractive women, therefore it doesn't apply to all women, therefore it's not gender-based er, harassment. <laughs> and they won. They won in court with that, and then it went to the Supreme Court and got overturned. Yeah. But can you believe it? Yeah. Well, it, it's just like, uh, speaking of that, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada once ruled that to be to, to discriminate on the basis of pregnancy was not discrimination against women. Yeah. Right? Even though only women <laughs> Hashtag can women. get yeah. pregnant, right? But it's not gender discrimination. So, you know, I, I think, and then of course they reverse themselves. And I think that our understanding, and this is why I've never been bored with, with human and, and quality rights, is because on the one hand, I'm fascinated at how many different ways we can find to unfairly treat other people. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I'm, I'm always um, great, grateful and, uh, that people are speaking, that people do speak up and say, this is unfair to me and others that are similarly situated to me and things have got to change. And then I go, oh, okay, well, can you please tell me more about that? If, if I don't understand, ask the question. Don't go, oh, no, that doesn't happen. Which is something else that happens, because you know, people's understanding of uh, somebody else's oppression is not always um, apparent. Mm. 
right? We, we're, we're all, we all have to learn and be able to be open to learning. Mm. Great. Um, Ah, oh, interesting. Because you know, internalized homophobia. I, I, I mean, I'm still, I still recognize it that it exists in me, and I'm a pretty out. Like I've been out since um, the '70s, like 1974. Um, but you know, it, it's. I still wonder. Oh, is it safe to hold my partner's hand? You know, or. Where am I? You know, is, is it going to be okay? Uh, and, and so on. And I, I and um, uh, and that's the generation I grew up in, where it was so unsafe. And it's not to say that it's safe now. There are par parts where I, of, of of the world where um, people are. It's it's still a death penalty situation if you're in in a in a same sex relationship. So um, I think that. Uh, uh, I, I just try, um, because it's a constant like trying to overcome, right? So I just try to remember that I don't need to take that on. I don't need to take the sexism, the racism. I just got to go do, be myself. And, um, and I think that's how I, uh, if you will, overcome it. You just have to live, your, live, your, live the truth of your life, which doesn't mean that that, that the out there doesn't impact you. It just means that you have to just plow through it, as I said earlier, you just plow through it. Yeah. So I think, last but not least, did you? We have some busy chatting that we didn't come up with the question. Oh, okay. well, just spontaneously, if anyone has one. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Nobody else? Yeah, right away. Well, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of my age. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm very interested. Every decade had, well, every decade had their own biases or whatever you could call it. So that's why uh, when there was a bit of an information uh, inter interruption with Elise, I said the dates are really important. Yeah. Your age and the dates because that made a difference. I came out in what, 57, I was 22. Uh, it was a no-go zone mm -hmm. in Montreal, it was the 50s. Uh, the only dykes were in cruddy bars run by the mafia. And the, so I didn't know anything about bars. And uh, anyway, it lasted exactly a year that I'm surprised it lasted that long. Uh, because it, it really was a no-go zone. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I finally came out when I was in my 40, uh, well, 40 actually, 40, 41. It was a totally different time. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm a little, uh, well, I'm 83 and a half. It's tie dates and the years together. Yeah. It's yeah. just like every decade just brings so many changes to it. I mean, not fantastic changes, but, you know, yesterday I saw a movie called um, My Name is January. Oh, yeah. Mm. Awesome. Mm. And, but uh, right there I got a lot of education about um, a group of people that I really don't know. And all the actors who were in the movie, it's a real movie, and the actors were part of it, and they talked about their lives, and I thought, oh, my God. You know, like, mm. and I'm 83 and a half, and I think I'm a shit. You know, like, not enough has changed. Oh, yeah, I feel really a little depressed about that. Yeah, and I don't want you to go ahead. And I think you all should see this movie. <laughs> I mean, it's January because I think, I, I think the emphasis really needs to be on younger people under mm -hmm. thirty. I really, I have no uh, patience with the old ones of thirty and over. I, you know, like, <laughs> a lot of people think I'm pretty stroppy, and it's true. Uh, you know, but shit, if I don't say it. It don't get said. <laughs> I'm like, how Sad boring is that? I, know <laughs> I think I'm, well, sometimes I'm ashamed to be a Canadian. I didn't know a no. real authentic yeah. Canadian. Yeah. Gee whiz. You know, that's no great distinction. Really. I mean, we haven't come far enough. 
Anyway, I'm on the platform. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give the last one to Branwyn. Uh, so, so a little about elections and <laughs> oh God, um, voting for a candidate that you can believe, I guess, not against. So, what if, this is more a practical question, but what if you can't believe in any candidate? What if you're like, you guys all just suck. <laughs> oh dear. Um, actually, I, I, I don't. I don't personally believe that. I mean, I, I recently met up with um, uh, the candidate for Vancouver Centre here for the NDP, Breen Wallet, who's a, a Métis uh, uh, young man, um, and uh, uh, he he. Um, is actually very, very thoughtful in his um, uh, responses to, like, I grilled him, okay? <laughs> but he was very thoughtful about his responses um, towards uh, um, uh, issues around the environment, um, issues around uh, the um, two-spirited communities, which is what he calls the queer community from his culture. And um, uh, and so I I I I'm very um, taken with uh, with with what he had to say and and how keen he is about making changes. Um, Jack Layton, when he was uh, alive, he was somebody that I I actually had a lot of um, um, time for. Uh, and um, so you know there are people there are people who go into politics. For the right reasons, and again, um, well, Libby Davies was one of the is somebody that I admire, um, and uh, but but it, it's you know when we talk about the system, and back to the question that you uh, asked, uh, it's it structurally the you know it's really hard to fight the structure, but there are good people that are that recognize that the structures are flawed and are willing to actually do something about it. And um, so I think if you're going to make an informed vote, don't be afraid about you know, asking to meet with your candidate and grilling them about the issues that are important. And if they don't measure up to what you think is important um, to your life and to your future, um, then you look for the person that did. And if you don't find that person, find the one person that's the closest. Because there's, no good, there's never going to be that perfect candidate. There's the, you know, the, because you might as well run, right? Because <laughs> you would be that perfect candidate. But I think the important thing is, is that, um, is that the, the, the candidate that comes closest the, the, the party principles and policies that come, because we're still in a party system, that come closest to where your heart is and where you believe, I think that's where you um, can, uh, can only hope for. And then, you know, if, they're, if, they're, if they don't do the right thing by what you, they said that they would do, well, there's always the next election. But don't give up on your democratic rights. I was raised in a country where I had no rights. I couldn't vote. And in fact, people are, are fighting in Hong Kong to have more of a democratic say. Um, under colonial rule, there was no such thing. We didn't have any rights to vote. Um, and so it's, it's like, you know, it, don't, don't squander it. Um, just because you don't think there's somebody that you want to vote for, find out who you might want to vote for. Um, and then hold them accountable the next time around. Oh, that's a great picture, yeah. by the way. I, I did run. I did run as NDP candidate um, in Port Moody, uh, Westwood, Port Coquitlam. And um, I campaigned with, um, with Jack. Uh, and uh, peeking out is, is um, uh, Bev Meslow, who also helped on my campaign. She ran in Vancouver South a lot. Um, but yeah, that was that was quite amazing. I didn't win because you know who knows I might still be MP. Then you'd be chatting with MP Sims. But <laughs> it, uh, but it was a it was a very uh, I think it was a very illuminating experience for me about um, democracy and what it takes um, to uh, put yourself out there. Yes, and one just one funny story. I 
I, what, one door knock that I made, um, somebody told me that he'd rather vote for the spawn of Satan than to vote for Leighton. <laughs> and all I could think of was, oh, that rhymed. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking Mary Ruth. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Um, and I, I would really like to uh, uh, thank all of you uh, for coming um, because you know it's all about being in community together, and you are the community. So thank you. And we have uh, many volunteers who helped us out today. Um, with this event, so I'd like to thank them uh, as well. Um, I did, th so for the first event, I feel like this came off super well, like we had very few glitches, and, but the only thing I forgot is an index card, so I'll just tell you uh, why I was going to leave the index card. So um, uh, I just, so the survey is anonymous, so you shouldn't put your name or anything like that on, on it, um, but if you wanted to recommend someone I should interview, uh, in a future uh, meeting. So we're going to be doing this every month. And you have a card here. Um, our next interviewee um, is Barbara Minshall, who lives in Nanaimo. And I was invited to Nanaimo to a group there to give a talk in the spring. And um, so that's where I met her. And uh, so she's uh, in October. So you can really, the, the most you can do to help me is share this event. So I have lots of those postcards. So if you could pick some up and if you go to a cafe, if you have friends, you know, just, just anywhere, post them. That would be fantastic. If you see, uh, follow the archives on Facebook. That's really where I do most stuff. I know young people don't use it anymore, but honestly, Instagram, I can't handle it. So um, <laughs> why? Why Instagram? I don't get it. Anyways, uh, so uh, share those events on, uh, on your Facebook feed with your friends. So the most you can do for us uh, is to get the word out about what we're doing here. Um, and then if you uh, want to learn, so the other thing about this project, like the part that's funded by the government, is this project was uh, an experiment in seeing if um, the community, um, building a community relationship with the archives itself. So some, one of the things I do is provide oral history training to people who want it. So the last thing is, if you are interested in learning more about how to do oral history interviews, uh, let me know. And if there's enough people interested, I will offer a training in that uh, as well. So those are the three things I'm interested in knowing. So on a separate piece of paper, uh, not the survey, if, you want, if I need your contact information, then if you could, you could pass that on to me. You can also send me an email. You could just chat with me afterwards. Oh my god, like, <laughs> what about that? Uh, so yeah, that's it. I want to thank everybody once again uh, for coming. Please take a cookie on your way out. And do take uh, the postcards with you and, do, and leave the surveys for me. And, and I, hopefully I will see you next month when we interview Barbara. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will show you the other photos. Oh. Oh, yeah. I will show you the so let's go back to the beginning. So there's the first one which we saw. So here's this other one. I love this one. <laughs> um, so we just saw that one. And then there's this one. Did you want to explain this? Oh, well, um, it's not the complete uh, uh, uniform that showed, but I am a serious Star Trek geek. <laughs> so that, that's my actual Star Trek uniform that I'm wearing um, under that. Thank you. Thank you. Tapper.